Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 566 for the 25th of August, 2019. Richard Saunders here with you, coming to you this week once again from the San Francisco Bay Area. Coming up on this week's show, I catch up with some people I first met way back in 2012. Ishil and Junaid from Turkey, now living in the Bay Area, and active skeptics not only in the Bay Area, but around the world and especially in Turkey via their podcast. Find out more when I interview Ishil and Junaid at the top of the show. Following that, join me as I walk up College Avenue for a couple of kilometers into Berkeley looking for woo, looking for interesting, shall we say, interesting claims along the way on shop fronts. It's always struck me when I visit the uh, the Bay Area that every now and then you'll come across a psychic hawking their wares on the street, as it were. But what else can we find as we walk along the streets of Berkeley? Then after that, it's Susan Gerbeck from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Now, Susan will give us an update on some of the projects that she and her team are working on right now on Wikipedia. Then to round off the show, a story from the pages of The Skeptic, Full Moon and Empty Heads by Barry Williams. All about the the belief that the full moon can affect uh, people's moods and behaviors. Stay tuned at the end of the show for more announcements from me. But now it's time for me to run upstairs, and I think I will have a melted cheese bagel. Melted cheese on a bagel. That sounds okay. While I'm doing that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Folks, way back in 2012, I was at the amazing meeting and I met a couple of people and and I thought, well, they would make an interesting interview. Little did I know, all these years later, I'd be sitting at their dining room table, feasting, (laughs) feasting on a wonderful uh, Turkish dinner and with a Rob Roy. Thank you, Jay. You're very welcome. We'll get to that later. I'm with uh, Isil, is that right? Or how do you... Ishil. Ishil. Yes. Ishil. And Jeanette? That's correct. Yes, Jeanette. Jeanette. Yes. No, I'll it's get like it. June 8th. June 8th. Yes. <laughs> it's like 8th of June, so it is easier to June remember. 8th. Yeah, perfect. Ooh. I remember that. Now, we spoke all those years ago. You're both from Turkey, and you're both now living in the United States, obviously. And just uh, then when we spoke, uh, you were starting a, a podcast, I think, all those years ago. Please bring us up to date. Sure. I think when we spoke, which was, I believe, seven years ago. Yes. And uh, we wow. were, um, w- I mean, Junaid and I started this Turkish skeptical, scientific skepticism blog um, a couple of years before we interviewed at that time. And we were hoping to start a podcast and be more active. And we did that. So all of that happened, and um, we're still ongoing uh, with our group. We're, the, our activities are still ongoing, and we just celebrated our tenth year as the as Yalan Savar, which is a Turkish scientific Woo-hoo! skeptical blog. One cheer from the back of the room. There. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, that's fantastic! But you're still doing podcasting, yes? Yes, we yes. are. We are not very regular. Uh, so the last episode is uh, six months ago, was six months ago, but that, that's kind of a um, deliberate choice. Uh, we wanted to have the, the content to be high quality instead of you know trying to release every week or every month. So we want to release new episodes when we are ready, when the content is good enough to share. So uh, we are not very, very regularly... Uh, Mm-hmm. releasing podcasts, episodes, but you know, we, we are still active. We have been very regular, actually, last year, um, but then this year a um, lot of things came in the way. We are a group of 10 people, uh, four of us in the United States, three here and one in Boston, and then we have 
people in Finland and England and a couple of people in Turkey. So it's all Turkish folks, but like spread around the um, country. So challenge, I mean, rec- recording a podcast is challenging. And this year has been extra challenging because one of us are getting married. The other one actually moved to England this year. So we had to like give a little bit yeah. of a hiatus. Um, but our, like, what, what happened is that out of those 10 people, we um, initiated our podcast and then two of our folks like in the same group also initiated another podcast can be translated muhabbet teorisi which can be translated like a conversation theory like the name it's also uh, açık bilim which is open science yeah so. so they do a weekly podcast on like more um uh, up-to-date issues and news and what is actually like recent and our podcast is more on the like fundamental scientific topics and epistemology and all so that's why like ours is a little bit more interval now because we go in more theory like conspiracy theories and stuff like that and theirs uh, which is actually two people from our team um, talk about like stuff that came up in the news like the recent developments and and whatnot so they have a weekly one we have like a sporadic one which which was every other uh, weekend week um, and now we're planning to go back to it after summer holiday hopefully but we're still home where we are like in the top science podcasts yeah i think today i checked we are um, in the science category we are number six in, uh, in, in all, on all, all the um, podcasts in Turkish. Now, as far as you know, you know what? I'm going to move around to this other chair. So sure. I'm leaning over a table, folks. It's, and Jay hasn't got me my third cocktail yet. It's, <laughs> he's running around the table. As far as you know, are, are podcasts as big in Turkey as they are in the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the world? Um, it is becoming bigger. Uh, I think it caught up in the last couple of years. Um, when we first was thinking about doing it, it was very rare and we had like a handful of uh, podcasts, I think. But in the last three years or so, or maybe four, um, there are more and more um, producers coming up and there are more podcasts are being produced. I'd imagine if I was in Turkey um, and I re- Turkish was my native language, I would love Turkish podcasts, of course, naturally. How big are podcasts in Turkey, do you know? I think now they're a pretty good listener volume. I would not know the number, but I do know how many we we had um, up to like a thirty to forty thousand downloads per month at one point. That's that's very respectable, especially in one language. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. I mean, when, when we think about my show or other shows uh, in English, of course, we're speaking about Australia, New Zealand, the United multiple States, countries, Canada, multiple right, countries. Yeah. But uh, apart from Turkey and Turkish citizens living uh, dotted around the world, I think that's uh, that, that's quite respectable. Yeah. I mean, we were surprised to see how many people actually downloaded it and listened to it. Um, we had um, in the blog, we have about like two plus million hits. <laughs> And uh, podcasts, like any time we do a new episode, which again, as Junaid mentioned, has not been super regular in the last year because of various reasons. But any time we do a new episode, we generally get like thirty to forty thousand downloads. Right. And a lot of like interaction also happens afterwards in Twitter or in the YouTube channel. Um, and now, as of last year, we even started to do something beyond the podcasts. Actually, in the last two years, so our. Um, our team members who are in Istanbul were able to secure a place who was donated to them by the place uh, management. Um, so the, there is this place called Dome in Istanbul. And actually, it's a place where Google Turkey also meets from time yes. to time. So it's like a Google themed building. It's an empty building. And their manager ended up being our listener. So he was... Uh, very happy to offer one of like his spaces every month for our team, and they are doing like a that noise. By the way, <laughs> it's a wonderful noise. It's Jay Diamond mixing a cocktail in the background there. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Carry on. Okay, so um, they were they actually donated to space to our team. So now our team in Turkey, which is which consists. Which consists four people, um, held holds um, regular monthly meetups, and every month they pick a topic, they create a presentation. So it's like skeptics in the pub almost, mm. but with the presentation and a topic and talk and discussion. Um, there's no um, like pub person because it's not a pub; it's more like a meetup space. But it's um, every month a lot of people come up and they do like a, 
have they they have a presentation and then afterwards chat and they look forward to it. They are they stop every year in the summertime because everyone goes to vacation yeah. in Turkey, um, and now they're starting to this year's rounds and they actually taught touched up very interesting and like um, I think um, what's the word popular subjects that people were were you know wondering to hear about. And now here you are living in the Bay Area. Yeah. And down here south of San Francisco, and you're very active in the Bay Area skeptics. And we, we, we're all looking over to Dr. Eugenie Scott, yeah. who's over there. <laughs> and that must be, I hope and I trust, it must be a, a wonderful thing for you. Yes, it's very, I mean, I'm very much honored to uh, be a member of the Bay Area Skeptics Group. Um, a very hard-working member, may I also add. Oh. <laughs> she is our treasurer, and you know what a job that can be. Oh, yeah. boy. So we do a lot of activities around, uh, like, organizing Skeptical, uh, our um, annual Northern California Science and Skeptical Conference, Skeptics Conference. Um, and then we put together monthly Skeptalks with the Bay Area Skeptics. I do the financing and treasury work, but I also help with a lot of, like, web site um, stuff that configure things and um, in general like help with uh, coordinating and organizing. Well, I must say I'm, I'm honored myself because I've not only be appeared at Skeptical uh, last year but I've also been a guest at the, the regular talks. Yes, Skeptical I was. Yes. I've given two or three talks over the years, over the years uh, for the Bay Area Skeptics and more to come I, I uh-huh. certainly hope. Yeah. So no, it's, I'm sorry, there's a statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've reached my limit, sadly, <laughs> it would seem. But is, isn't it wonderful? Because uh, I've known you now since t- 2012, both of you, on and off, because we see each other yeah, occasionally. Every yeah, yeah. <laughs> every, conference. every major conference yes. we see each other That's and right. catch up. So. But I, I, I don't know if this is true, but maybe I was the first person to interview you two. I think, I, that, I think that was the case, the case. And, yeah. and you are the inspiration for our podcast, actually, you know, uh, after listening to your podcast and doing the interview with you and listening to other podcasts in English, we, we said that, okay, yeah, there's a nice content there that we can share with other people who are maybe unaware of the skeptical movement, mm. just like we were in the beginning. So we can share that. And that's, I think, the main reason uh, behind our podcast being so popular in Turkey, that we are sharing the information. We are yeah. We're sitting on the shoulders of giants, <laughs> you know, getting all that information from, you know, various skeptics or you. And there's lots of good content in English. And we are kind of translating the ideas to, to Turkish and yeah. uh, bringing up that uh, yeah, movement. Yeah. You know, Crossing that language gap, yeah. essentially, because, you know, there's so many good content produced already here and just looking at it and being inspired is um, it's easy. I mean, I think our job is easier because there's already like so much work is being done there. But um, I also want to point out that one of the things that made me very happy in the last year I think we came to a point after 10 years, like moving from like being a website and a podcast to become a little bit more. I would say almost like a respected opinion uh, in in like overall Turkish media. So a couple of examples last year, um, we were called, uh, we were we were invited by um, a medical school, which happens to be the medical school I graduated from, um, to give a two full day seminar to medical students on science based skepticism and science based medicine and critical thinking. And critical thinking. And this was a, like a full like weekend invitation to us, and they told us like, come, please come and then create a curriculum and you know come up with uh, with a plan, and then you know just it's like two days is yours. They gave us space in the school of medicine, and it was a pretty good conference space, and we had we we had two two hundred people showed up. Um, and not only medical students from the school that invited us, we ended up getting people from like surrounding other medical schools. We got, ended up getting like uh, um, academicians, like professors. Wow. And at the end of the conference, actually, we got invitations to three other medical schools to come and do something similar to them. And a week, and about a m- month after that, I, g- I got an invitation from another medical school in Turkey, this time from Ankara, and they asked. Because I gave two presentations in that workshop, um, and m- many of our friends give other presentations. So we covered things like, um, 
you know, fundamentals of critical thinking, anti-vaccine movement, uh, you know, energy um, hoaxes and scams. Um, we talked about um, naturalistic fallacy and how to evaluate claims in both media, uh, newspapers, even in science journals. Like, how do you tell a journal is really or journal article is really um, worth, you know, worthwhile, or is it just like a you know article to be published? Yeah. Um, so. Um, another another professor from another medical school reached out to us and asked us to repeat the anti-vaccine presentation. So I gave a WebEx to like another hundred med school students. Fantastic. Um, and then I I ended up like publishing an anti-vaccine um, article in one of the journals in Turkey. So this makes us very proud that we I I think now we're kind of like beyond just being a blog or a podcast, like people do look at us and, you know, invite us as experts in this area and give, you know, like talks or educate students, which is amazing. It's a trusted source yeah, uh, because there are lots of misinformation happening in Turkey as well, just like every other place. In, yeah, in- I'm not I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, finally, where, well, almost finally, almost, where can people go online to find out uh, your information, your blog, your podcast? Uh, first, they need to be native, or they need to be Turkish speakers, native, or like they should be able to understand Turkish language because we do blog and create content in Turkish, which is uh, very rare to find in Turkish language. So if they know and they want to check, um, they can go to www.yalansavar.org, which is... Um, shall I spell it or do you want to give like well, the... if, if they, they speak Turkish they will probably... <laughs> yes. one nice thing about Turkish it is a phonetic language ah. so you know yeah. as long as you yeah. you can hear the, the word you know yeah. how to write it so yeah. don't worry folks links, <laughs> links in the show notes okay um, and then if they just want if they don't speak Turkish and if they just want to have some fun, they can still go to the website and put it in Google Translate and it just makes it hilarious. It will be fun. (laughs) (laughs) And And also, also I'd like to uh, give the the address of the the other podcast that our two members are uh, are doing. Uh, So it's Açıkbilim, Açıkbilim açıkbilim.com. Is it com or... or, uh, I don't know that, Buck. I... I think it's calm. Um, we will, we well, will provide the search, podcast to yeah. Richard, so you can check them in the show. Açık bilim ve muhabbet teorisi. So Yalansavar actually means... Um, so we we were looking for a name, and our criteria was that it should be easy to say, it should be very Turkish, and then it should not have any special Turkish characters, oh. which both Junaid and I suffer day-to-day because of our names, because they have Turkish characters. So, you know, it's kind of like hard to type in whatever keyboard you are using. So we picked that because Yalan means lie in Turkish, and Savar means like deflect or ah. and uh, it's also a word play it's like a pun because um what's what's the name of uçak savar what's the name of that anti uh, plane or anti missile you know like you have these anti aircraft oh. yes anti-aircraft. so anti aircraft are uçak savar which means you know oh. plane savar so it's like gets rid of the planes so we thought we will just make it like yalan savar which is very much similar ammo um, to the choir <laughs> it, it does not have actually like the ammo or violent um, part of it it's more like uh, repellent it's kind of hard to explain you know especially when the name is a pun it's yeah. Yeah. It kind of like loses its, um, you know, Turkish spirit a little bit. Listeners get it right yes, away. Yes, Turkish listeners would know what Yalan Savar is. And speaking of our Turkish listeners, to round up, uh, round off this interview, please, please give a message in Turkish for our Turkish listeners. They're looking at me like, what? <laughs> like, what should I say? What should you say? Eğer, <laughs> that is this hard. Is like, I need, to, I need to switch my mind to Turkish now, which is kind of hard. Um, eğer önünüze çıkan iddiaların doğruluğunu merak ediyor ve bu iddiaların doğruluğunu nasıl e, teyit edeceğinizin yöntemlerini öğrenmek istiyorsanız yalansavar.org adresine gider, gidip e, veya Yalansavar podcastini dinleyip e, bize katılabilirsiniz. Karanlığa lanet okumaktansa bir mum yakmak yeğdir. They're both nodding so I guess that's a good thing. <gülüyor> that is actually the Turkish version of It's Better to Curse. Uh, it's better to light a candle than the curse of darkness. Oh, That's what he said. brilliant, <laughs> lovely. What, Which is excellent. our motto in, in our Fantastic. website. And our logo is a burning candle. Excellent. Well, 
so nice to to um, see you again, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you both again very soon. We definitely will. Yep, yep. We would love to meet you again somewhere sometimes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> More cooking. <laughs> Allora ciao, io mi chiamo Professore Dave, io ti voglio insegnare tutte le cose sulla scienza, parliamo di fisica, di chimica, biologia, astronomia, matematica e tante altre cose. Guardami su YouTube, arrivederci! Hey everyone, this is Professor Dave. I want to teach you about all kinds of things regarding science. I want to tell you about physics. I want to tell you about chemistry, biology, astronomy, math, and many, many more things. Come check me out on YouTube. The channel is called Professor Dave Explains. Take it easy. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave Explains. I'm on a bus bumping along outside of the San Francisco area, not too far outside. I'm heading for Berkeley. Wonderful, crazy, fantastic, fascinating Berkeley. I'm going to walk a couple of kilometers into Berkeley and see what, uh, woo, strange things I can find along the way. See what woo shops, what new age things Um, jump out at me. I wonder what I will find. Well, now I'm in the little town of Rock Ridge, walking up College Avenue. This street will take me eventually, after some kilometers into Berkeley. And I didn't have to go long to find something interesting. It's The shop front with a big poster out the front, big sign, Brema, the art of being present, it says. Brema intensive and weekend workshops, the art of being present. Brema bodywork, Brema self Brema exercises and the nine principles of harmony are natural expressions of the unifying principle of existence. It's good to know. They provide ideal support for practicing mind-body connection and the art of being present. Both new and experienced students from around the world study at Brema weekends and intensive weekends and intensives to benefit from Brema's practical approach to living harmoniously. There we go. And that can be found at Brema.com and they look like they're coming here in November. Well, that's a new one on me, Brema. Just waiting at the corner of the street now for the lights to change so I can cross over and keep going. Here's a little note, and I wonder if my listeners in California might agree, or maybe have noticed that I'm guessing, from my experience driving around the San Francisco area, that maybe 50% of drivers actually indicate. Maybe 60% of drivers, many, simply don't use the, their indicator. It's quite amazing. And I guess in a strange way you get used to it. You always have to think, what that car, what's that car going to do? Are they going left or right? Because um, a lot of the time you just simply have to guess. Well, the next interesting one we've come across, not too far up the street here, Reboot. Float and cryo spa. What is cryotherapy? Whole body cryotherapy exposes your skin to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit air for two to three minutes. Hmm. The body's cold shock response provides powerful healing and recovery for both the body and the mind. We also offer local cryo to target a specific area and cryo facials to rejuvenate your skin and fight signs of aging. Good grief. 
They also provide a float tank. Now, many years ago, I tried out a float tank and I must say it is very, very relaxing. Now I'm just passing a little, I guess it's a cafe, yes. Urban, urban Remedy. Certified organic, gluten-free, non-GMO meals, snacks, juices, teas and cleansers. Well, you know, if you'd like to buy something that is gluten-free and non-GMO, I wonder how they determine that. Good luck. You can come here and try it out. Well, I've made it to Telegraph Street in Berkeley. Very famous street right near uh, the university here. And I was a little bit, I guess disappointed would be the wrong word. I didn't pass any psychic shops on my trip up here. But I haven't given up yet. So I'm going to wander down Telegraph a little way. I've uh, changed microphones by the way to look a little less conspicuous. And for those who are interested, I'm using a my iPhone with a popping filter and to all the world it looks like I'm chatting on my phone although it looks a bit odd with a big red popping filter <laughs> nevertheless I can only guess it's orientation week here because I'm passing dozens and dozens and dozens of what I guess the students new students here to Berkeley all wearing a lanyard which says Cal on it and being taken around by tour guides. And uh, wow, what an exciting time in their lives. Aha! Uh -huh. All right, so here I am at the corner of Telegraph and Blake. For those of you following at home on your map. And right on the corner here we have Quite interesting it's like an everything shop and I guess I've hit pay dirt here folks oh man oh boy neon sign chakra cleansing it's also a TV and electronic store so I'm not sure how that works oh that's around the corner <laughs> fortune teller psychic palm tarot reader in neon signs out the front fortune teller love marriage relation business bring your problems to me 100% guarantee solved and the phone number and the phone number looks like to be or some information is also repeated in Chinese the next uh, little sign here on the side of the road says same thing fortune teller love marriage relation business and we have another sign with a a palm with an eye on it and the first part's in Chinese I assume and the second part says faith will help you control your destiny leave your worries pain and loneliness behind change your luck and improve your love life and future by consulting a caring professional psychic who truly understands your needs whatever your dreams may be I wonder who wrote this Find our, find our how, find our how, <laughs> yes I'm reading it right, find our how to achieve success and happiness. Faith will help you through love, money, reunite the sickness and sexual problems. Uh -huh. Faith will not ask you, she will tell you why you called. She will call out your friends, enemies, and loved ones by name. F oh, of course, Faith is the name of the psychic, I guess. Faith has helped thousands across the world. Let her help you. See results within 24 hours, guaranteed. And we're at 2556 Telegraph Avenue, Berkeley. Open seven days. So there you go. My search has been successful. I found the classic palm reader tarot store right here in Berkeley with neon signs and chakra cleansing
the Surf Coast Summer Spring Skeptic Camp, 14th of September. The Surf Coast Summer Spring Skeptic Camp, SCSSC, is Australia's longest running Skeptic Camp. This year we are celebrating our seventh year. If you want to share something on a skeptically related topic in which you are interested, highlight some practices that you see as dubious that need to be brought to the attention of the skeptical community, please offer to share your thoughts. This is a sharing event where many contributors combine to make a great day. The event is free. However, please provide your own lunch. But don't worry, there are plenty of options locally. Tea, coffee and biscuits will be provided all day. That's Saturday the 14th of September 2019, 10.30am to 4pm. The location is Aries Inlet Community Hall, 6 Great Ocean Road, Aries Inlet, Victoria. Offers to present should be made to the Skeptic Groups of Victoria email address at sgofvic at gmail.com. And to register, just follow the links in this week's show notes. The Surf Coast Summer Spring Skeptic Camp, Australia's longest running Skeptic Camp. think we need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic. Hello all, it's Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. I wanted to share with you a few highlights of the Wikipedia work my team has been working on. I should mention that we are involved with small changes all the time, adding citations, photos, video, also reverting vandalism and general cleanup. The most visual things we do are complete rewrites and new page creation. Since we have existed as a team, we have written 1,117 pages in many languages, and those 1,117 pages have been viewed over 47 million times. Very cool, I know, huh? So trying to choose pages to talk to you about can be quite difficult, but maybe a few of these will spark your interest. First up is a Wikipedia page written by editor John Guyton. He was inspired to write this page after listening to The Skeptic Zone, episode 517. And I'm surprised this page didn't already exist. Detoxification foot baths. Every time I've gone for a pedicure, the staff offers this to me. And I thought, I heard it was a scam, but, you know, I didn't really know why. So after reading the Wikipedia page, I know why. You put your feet in this water, and after a few minutes, the water turns color, usually a brown color. And they say that the foot bath is removing toxins. And if the water is brown, then it's from the liver. You're having your cellular energy rebalanced, apparently. Sorry to spoil the party, but what happens is water is salt water. The machine has an electric current run to electrode array, which causes rust. This happens quite quickly in a process called electrolysis. The reaction happens regardless or not if your feet are in the water. You know, it's, it doesn't matter if your feet are there or not. Moving on. I and others have been concerned with the glowing Wikipedia articles written about people who use facilitated communication to communicate. And that word communicate is in quotes. If you don't know what facilitated communication is, then spend some time reading all about it on the terrific Wikipedia page we wrote years ago. What is going on is that facilitated communication is a proven pseudoscience that supporters think nonverbal people are able to type if they just have someone hold their hand or guide them, like a pointer or a Ouija board. Once these people are using facilitated communication, they suddenly can write poetry and engage in long conversations far above their schooling level. What is happening is that the facilitator is actually doing the typing. Anyway, we have been going through Wikipedia pages for these facilitated 
communication users and challenging the Wikipedia pages for their accuracy. The facilitator is the author of the poetry or the book or the essay, not the facilitated communication user. Several of the Wikipedia pages have been deleted or merged into other articles. This has had the facilitated communication community very upset, as you can imagine. But until they can show some serious evidence showing that it actually works, then the pages will continue to be deleted or merged. One child has a popular documentary made about him. It's called DJ, which is spelled D-E-E-J. DJ has graduated college, given lectures, directed plays, and written articles. The movie never shows any of this directly happening. Um, images are very close up shots that don't show him typing independently. You'll see his fingers moving, but you can't tell that actually there's someone holding his hand and guiding him, or even if it is his own hands. Um, sometimes they use a computerized voice. It's, it's um, supposedly his voice, you know, typing it in, and then it's played over the over the keyboard uh, communication, but we never see that actually being typed in. His mother or his facilitator always is by his side holding his hand over the keyboard. So who is actually doing the communication? It's a total heart melting story, so as long as you don't think about it much. So Craig Foster has just published an exhaustive review of the documentary called DJ Avu. <laughs> Clever, huh? DJ Avu which calls in question the authorship and explains the history of facilitated communication and its lack of scientific vigor. Now, GSOW editors Rob Gutentag and Rob Palmer updated the DJ Wikipedia page with Foster's review, so now people are reading about DJ will get a lot more understanding of what is actually going on. The Wikipedia page for the book, A Return to Love, which is written by U.S. presidential candidate Marianne Williamson, got a rewrite by GSOW editors Wyatt Smith and Rob Palmer. The full name of the book might make its contents clear. A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of a Course in Miracles. Mind Body Interventions is a Wikipedia page that received a rewrite by editor Patrick. This describes health and fitness interventions that are supposed to work like yoga, tai chi, hypnotist, prayer, and all the therapies like dance, art, music. This is not feeling good kind of therapy, but they claim something that's like the medical community has deemed pseudoscience. It's all a bit confusing to explain, and Patrick said it was a bear to rewrite. So check it out. And that was called mind-body interventions. Before I give you one more, I'd like to mention that very rarely do we have to deal with vandalism or people reverting our writings. I get this question all the time. You would think we'd spend all our time protecting our work, but GSOW editors are people just like you. Many joined our team after hearing us on the Skeptic Zone. Most had no special experience with coding or anything related to editing Wikipedia. Um, we specialize in training from the very basics. It can only take a few months, which is a few months, but when you're done, you will know that what you're doing and it's very difficult to push back on any of the work we do. So lastly, this is a very Australian Wikipedia page. Editors Julie and Harold Barrett from the Brisbane Skeptics love to travel. GSOW does not only focus on pseudoscience, but anything related to science. Avid bird watchers Julie and Harold decided to write the Wikipedia page for a book they used often, The Australian Bird Guide. The authors are Mink, Horst, Rogers, and Clark. And it's such a sweet guidebook, and it brings so much joy to bird watchers. I'm glad it now has a Wikipedia page, which should help it get more attention. So that's all for now, Skeptic Zone listeners. This is just a small sample of the important work we can do. If you'd like more information, you can find us on our website, gsowteam.org, or on Facebook. I will be speaking at SciCon in Las Vegas in October, at the New Zealand Skeptics Conference at the end of November, and Skepticon in early December. Please come out and say hi. The Earth is only 6,000 years old. That's what Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum say. And how can a museum be wrong? Isn't Dr. Oz just wonderful? I love today's episode. It didn't talk down to his adoring audience of women at all. 
Science has proved that the subatomic quantum realm is as real as it is counterintuitive and bizarre. Therefore, I can use it to support quantum healing and quantum consciousness. After all, how can journals like Aquarius Metaphysics be wrong? Evolution is just a theory. After all, if we came from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? We all have friends and family who believe these things and much more. Well, if you're a rational thinker who is tired of arguing on social media and never getting anywhere, we have a solution for you. Join the Guerrilla Skepticism and Wikipedia team and we will teach you how to add reliable scientific and skeptical information to the world's number one source of information, Wikipedia. We write new articles and improve existing ones. We remove pseudoscience, paranormal, and alt-med claims, substituting the actual facts. And we operate in many languages. We've already reached tens of millions of people searching for information, but, as you can imagine, we can never do enough. So please, join us. All you need is a PC and the desire to help educate the planet. In fact, you'll be educating the world while you sleep. Contact us at gsowteam at gmail.com. Guerrilla Skepticism. The time is is now. now. Music by purpleplanet.com. It's time once again to dive into the pages of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics. This week we're going back to 1991, volume 11, number 3. On page 8, an article by Barry Williams. Full Moon and Empty Heads. A commonly held belief has it that various social phenomena are associated with the phases of the moon. Such is the strength of this belief, achieving folklore status in many societies, that it is accepted almost without question, especially by the popular media. There are at least two possible reasons why this belief is so strongly held. It may be that it is true, or it may be that some other factor is in play and makes it appear to be true. A number of studies have been conducted into this assumed phenomenon, some of which purport to show that there is some validity in the hypothesis that the phase of the moon has an effect on such things as childbirth, suicides, accidents, bleeding and mental instability. Many other studies are unable to show that any such relationship exists. Details of several of these studies can be found in The Moon and the Maternity Ward, Bell and Greenspan, in Paranormal Borderlands of Science, Prometheus 1991, and The Moon is Acquitted of Murder in Cleveland, in Sandalik, in Science Confronts the Paranormal, Prometheus, 1986, and in various back issues of the Skeptical Inquirer. Informal inquiries among emergency service workers and hospital staff have revealed a belief that when the moon is full, there is an increase in the number of accidents and in the rate of bleeding in patients undergoing surgery. Other inquiries show that most of the people questioned in common with most of the population at large, have no idea of what the phase of the moon is at any particular time. This raises the suspicion that when any particular period of increased activity occurs, those involved, having cognizance of the folklore, may well assume that it must be full, without any real knowledge of whether or not this is the case. If this is true, then the lunar effect could easily achieve the status of a self-sustaining myth without the benefit of any facts intruding into the case. Although it would not be easy to prove it, there is a strong suspicion that this very simple explanation can account for most of the folklore associated with the lunar effect. Before we seek to discover whether or not a lunar effect is a reasonable supposition, we should consider some of the facts about the moon and its relationship to the Earth. Earth is the only one of the four inner Earth-like planets to have a substantial natural satellite, 
Mercury and Venus have none, and Mars has two very small ones. Each of the four gas giant planets has a retinue of major and minor satellites, and Pluto, as far as can be presently ascertained, has only one. Our Moon is a respectable body, being the sixth largest of all the satellites and is larger than the planet Pluto. The Moon travels in an elliptical orbit around Earth, or, to be more accurate, both the Earth and the Moon orbit about a point called the barycenter which is located in a direct line between the centers of the two bodies and about one-third of the distance between Earth's surface and its center. At its closest approach, perigee, the Moon is 354,000 kilometers from Earth's center, and at its furthest point, apogee, it is 404,000 kilometers away. The Moon makes one rotation on its axis, and one revolution about Earth every 27.3 days. But, because of the Earth's motion around the Sun, one lunation, the period between the beginning of a particular phase and the next beginning of the same phase, is 29.53 days. The Moon's orbit is also tilted at about 5 degrees to the elliptic, the projection of the Moon's orbit against the celestial sphere or the apparent path of the Sun against the background stars. This is fortunate for lovers of full moons. If it were not so, every full moon would occur simultaneously with a lunar eclipse and every new moon would produce a solar eclipse. The moonlight, we see, is only reflected sunlight, the Moon having no intrinsic luminosity and as such its albedo, the fraction of incident light reflected, that only approximately 7% of the incident sunlight is reflected to us as moonlight. We are all familiar with the moon's tidal effect on the oceans of the Earth, which is a function of gravitational attraction between the two bodies. This effect is directly proportional to the mass of the two bodies and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Less well-known effects of the tidal interaction are the synchronous or captured motion of the Moon in that it always presents the same face to the Earth and the fact that the dissipation of tidal energy means that the Earth's rotation is slowing by 0.02 seconds per century and that this slowing of the Earth's rotational speed is transferred by conservation of angular momentum to the Moon, causing it to speed up and recede from the Earth by about 4.5 centimeters per year. These are the two main physical effects of the two bodies. I make no mention here of the more psychological effects of moonlight on the more romantic denizens of Tin Pan Alley such these lie outside the orbit of this article. In the context of the facts mentioned above, what does the term full moon mean? As moonlight is reflected sunlight, we see a full moon only when the sun, earth and moon lie in an approximate straight line with the earth between the other two bodies. That is when the sun is shining directly on the lunar face we can see. On the opposite side of its orbit, when the sun is shining on the side of the moon we never see, we have a new moon, when we cannot see the moon at all. Actually, we can sometimes see a very faint moon by reflected earthlight. The other phases lie between these two extremes and are dependent on the angles between the three bodies. One physical effect of the moon on earth is dependent on the phase of the moon, the height of tides. When the Sun, Moon and Earth are in a line, either at full or new moon, then we get spring higher than normal tides. This is caused by the tidal effects of the Sun and the Moon being cumulative. At other times, when the three bodies subtend an angle other than 180 degrees, the solar and lunar tidal effects tend to ameliorate each other to some extent. Why the tidal effects between the Earth and the Moon may be substantial, these effects of the Moon on a single human being are so minute as to be unmeasurable, and this is what we should be considering when seeking any particular lunar effect 
on individual people. Tidal effect, as was mentioned earlier, is a function of gravitational attraction. The gravitational effect of the Earth on each of us is so weak that we can stand up, jump or climb up a ladder, despite the entire mass of the Earth trying to prevent it. The Moon has only one eighty-one-th of the Earth's mass and is sixty times as far away from us as is the center of the Earth, not forgetting that the gravitational attraction falls off as a function of the square of the distance, showing that the Moon's gravitational attraction on us is negligible. Add to this the fact that the tidal effect of the Moon on Earth is enhanced when the Sun, Moon and Earth are in line, then if gravity has anything to do with this lunar effect, its effect at new moon should be even stronger than at full moon. We should also have a solar effect, because while the sun's tidal effect is less than the moon, it is nonetheless significant. And should we not forget the fact that at some times, perigee, the moon is 50,000 kilometers closer to us than at others, apogee. Perigee and apogee have nothing to do with the moon's phases. This difference in distance, remembering the inverse square rule, certainly should have a greater effect than would the different phases. Why then has the perigee effect not become part of our folklore? I suggest that no one, apart from a few astronomers, has any idea when the moon is at perigee, or indeed that such a thing as perigee even exists. While everyone has been exposed, through the media, to the full moon effect mythology, and only has to look at the night sky to determine when there is a full moon. Unless we accept the mysterious energies unknown to science, which have been covered before in this magazine, volume 10, number 1, and for which there is no evidence outside the fevered imaginations of those who would postulate a paranormal view of the world, we have to assume that any full moon effect must be mediated by either gravitational or electromagnetic radiation. Gravity, as shown above, would appear to be a very poor candidate, and electromagnetic radiation would appear to be even worse. The only difference in electromagnetic radiation we experience at different phases of the moon is in the amount of reflected sunlight we see. If reflected sunlight can have such an effect, then we should experience a very much more noticeable effect between day and night here on Earth. We certainly get orders of magnitude more sunlight reflected from our own planet on any day than we do from a few pathetic glimmers from moonlight, no matter how full the moon. Regardless of how irrational it may appear, if there is indeed a lunar effect, then somehow we should be able to work out how it occurs. We human beings have managed to solve far more difficult problems than this, as any non-scientist who has ever read about relativity and quantum physics will attest. But, as it has been stated many times before in this magazine, there is not much point in wasting time on discovering how something occurs until it has been established that it does occur. Until there is a great deal more evidence that there is a lunar effect, we are perfectly entitled to regard it as nothing more than moonshine. And that was Full Moon and Empty Heads by Barry Williams, published in The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, volume 11, number 1, from 1991. And that issue, together with other issues going back to 1981, are yours free to download at www.skeptics.com.au. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Now here's a quick note from our friends at the Morty Alex Skeptics in the Pub. Morty Skeptics in the Pub on Tuesday, the 3rd of September from 7.30pm. We have a talk STEM, looking beyond the surface 
to see what it is and what it's not. Now, I've had the pleasure over the years of uh, speaking at Morty Skeptics in the pub. If you'd like to find out more, go along, have a drink and attend the talk. I will put a link in this week's show notes, or you can just Google Morty Alec Skeptics in the pub. I'm looking forward to meeting Skeptic Zone fans and friends at Dragon Con. And in fact, next week's episode of the Skeptic Zone will be coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. And if you are going to be uh, coming along to Dragon Con, there's a Skeptic Zone live recording on Saturday, the 31st of August at 5.30 p.m. at the Skept Track, which is in the Hilton Hotel. Once again, thank you to those people who contribute to the Skeptic Zone via Patreon at skepticzone.tv. And uh, as you know, and as I always say, it's your contributions, your uh, patronage that uh, keeps the show going. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the San Francisco Bay Area. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. And press stop. Give it done. Say, <laughs> it, say almost, it almost sounds like you've done this before. No. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Not once. This is really good. And now we're speaking to Jay Diamond here on the Skeptics. And Jay, we have to play the dice game. Delightful. We do. We don't Delightful. have. Do you have a dice? I don't. <laughs> I have dice. You have dice? We're gonna have a hard time playing the dice. She's going to get dice. some dice. All right, folks. As you know, well, some of you know. At the end of the show, every week, not every week, a lot of the I times. Have every time. <gasps> Holy mackerel! Look at this. It's a lot of dice. We've got a D. 20, D, oh my goodness, you have D they're beautiful. D6. Those are beautiful. Mm-hmm. What's that one? That's a D... That's a D20. You are such a geek. Let's play with the D20. And I have a Cthulhu on the Oh, board. it's beautiful. Fantastic. It's a what? It's a Cthulhu. We're going to play with the D20. Yes. So the idea is I'm going to roll this three times. Yes. And folks at home, listening in your car, listening, jogging, walking the dog, doing the dishes, whatever you're doing. And you long-distance truck drivers in Canada. Canada, Jay. Central Canada. Central Canada, who who write to me. One, anyway. All right. So I want you to use your... Everybody laugh in a minute, ready? I want you to use your psychic powers... (laughs) To... to, to, Oh, dear. Losing the plot. To guess... Guess. I'm sorry. To predict the number that's going to come up. Are you, are, are you going to predict? Be- I'm going to predict it. Okay. One to 20. What, what is your prediction? It is a seven. Oh. Of course. Is, was there any question, really? And you can be my uh, independent judge. So this is real, right? Here we go. This is real. I'm rolling the dice now. It's a seven. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> the first number is nine, 19. It, it, it might not be seven. Seven is somewhere on that dice. Seven it is. is somewhere okay. on that dice. Okay, the first number is... It is 19. 19. What's your, your next psychic prediction? <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is 14. Ooh, 14, here we go. It's definitely 14. Definitely. <gasps> What's that? That is 17. 17. <laughs> I was only three away. You're getting it's closer. It's extremely close. You're getting it closer. I would... your previous prediction. Obviously. Mm-hmm. Obviously. You have one more shot at yeah, this. Yeah. Come on. It's uh, four. Four. Here we Obviously. Go. Shaking it now and... Obviously. Three! Three. Oh! I was so cl- Only one away. I just missed it. That's you almost like exact. Semi-psychic. Uh, it's sem- uh, more than semi. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, well, he's a, a psychic. Didn't he say he was a semi driver? He must be a semi psychic. <laughs>